Good morning. The first reading is selected verses from the 15th chapter of Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward should be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No, one but your very own issue shall be the, your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these things and cut them in two, laying each half against the other but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Here ends the first reading. This morning's psalm reading is from the 27th chapter, and we will read the verses responsively. The Lord is my light and my salvation, who then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise up against me, my trust will not be shaken. For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter. Hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary and raise me high upon a rock. Hear my voice, voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away. You have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my oppressors. Me 
This I believe, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Today's second reading is from the third and fourth chapter of Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Glory to you, o Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today and tomorrow and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Thanks. In the movie, uh, Yuli's Gold, Peter Fonda plays a tired man who is a beekeeper by day. He runs the old family business of collecting and selling the golden honey that pays the bills. It's exhausting work for a man in his late 60s. Yuli does most of it himself because he cannot afford to have someone help him. And so he maintains the, and moves the hives, he gathers the trays, he separates the honey from the wax, he spins the final product into jars, and he ships it off to market. And he worries about the ebb and flow of money offered by his distributor. He doesn't sleep well at night. But really, what really causes Yuli to worry is his daughter and her children. His daughter is in and out of drug treatment facilities and long ago left the three children with Yuli and his wife. And now that his wife is dead, only, it's only Yuli. His daughter phones about twice a year. And in one scene, the oldest girl, around 16, is about to leave on a date with her older boyfriend. And Yuli has worried about her for weeks, not knowing exactly what to do. Remembering his own daughter's rebellion at about the same age, And slumped down in a chair, he's exhausted from a 14-hour day. Before she steps through the screen door, Yuli says, Now remember, curfew is 12 o'clock. And his granddaughter stops at the far end of the living room. And she turns and she says with a face that is half sneer and half smile, well, I'd like to see you make me do it. And the screen door slams behind her, and Yuli knows she's right. He's powerless to make her do much of anything anymore. One of the popular images of Jesus in many religious circles is that he is a man who can do anything. He can walk on water. He can turn a couple of fish and a few loaves into a feast for thousands. He can even raise the dead. That's our Jesus, they say. He can do anything. Well, today's gospel rather loudly disproves that popular claim. Jesus can do many impressive things, but one thing he cannot do is make us love him. He cannot legislate love nor control human will. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus cannot do just anything. He has tried to gather this particular flock many times, often, he says. It's a strange thing to say out loud, but Jesus failed at that. He struck out. He'll walk out of a tomb in a few days, but apparently he can't walk into our hearts without permission. How often have I desired to gather you, and you were not willing. 
I suspect Yuli knows exactly how Jesus feels. I suspect anyone who has loved somebody deeply and knows they can't shelter them from harm's way understands the pain in Jesus' lament over the city. Jesus can do a lot of amazing things, but he can only watch as his sons and daughters go through the screen door saying, I'd like to see you make me. His will cannot overpower our wills. He's off the chart with a lot of things. But Jesus is powerless to do that. A blonde co-ed gets the attention of a college freshman. At first, he was subtle, smiles in the lunch line, hellos on the way to class, then a little bolder, a phone number was secured, they dated a few times, and then overbearingly mushy on a park bench in the middle of campus. But it was not to be. He finally got the drift. She was never home when he called. They never passed each other on the way to class anymore. And finally, word got back that she was dating someone else. Unreturned love for a 19-year-old is as close to the end of the world as one may ever come. Jesus' desire for us, no doubt, is a bit different than that desire of that, for that young woman. But it is similar in this regard. Jesus is willing to make a fool of himself to get our attention. And he likens himself to a hen, to a chicken. Out of all the animals that Jesus could have chosen, <laughs> he chooses a chicken. He could have chosen the powerful eagle of the book of Exodus. On, I bore you on eagle's wings. There's a cagey leopard prowling around through the pages of Hosea. And God is likened to a lion elsewhere. But a chicken? <laughs> what kind of confidence does a chicken instill? When we, stand, we send our children out the screen door to face the perils of this world, wouldn't you prefer the God of a ravening lion at your child's side rather than Jesus, the mother hen? How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And there you have it. Another image for what God is like like a hen gathering her brood under her wings. Have you ever spent time watching geese or ducks? I often will do that at the lake. There are always several mallard hens, each with a brood ranging from three, sometimes up to 13 or 14. And it's always interesting to watch as, how they, as to how they take care of them. And when anyone approaches the lake, the mother mallard became, would become immediately aware and would gather her little brood together and hustle them off into the reeds which, that surrounds the edge of the lake or scurry them out into the open water. One day our dog got really close and she flew up and she landed on the water not far from it, quacking and creating a real disturbance. I was rather surprised by that at first, a mother abandoning her young. But then it became obvious that she, what she was up to, she was offering herself as a decoy. And she wanted the intruder to notice and to follow her away from the ducklings. She was willing to sacrifice herself in order to protect her offspring. Now maybe we can understand the lament and the passion in Jesus' own voice. It is the cry of a mother who is worried to death about not only Jerusalem, 
but about all of us. Like a mother, Jesus sees far more clearly than do we, the children, the danger we are in. Like a mother, Jesus knows we tend to overestimate our powers and are prone to go off on our own, leaving the protective wings to seek our own excitement and adventure. And like a mother, Jesus chases after us. Do you see the image? Like a mother, Jesus' love is so great that his all-consuming passion is to sweep us up into his protective arms. And although there are others in pursuit of him, namely Herod, Jesus, like a mother, is persistent. He sticks to what his love compels him to do. He pursues his flock with a passion. And his answer to Herod show that he has a little work to do in Galilee yet, a few chicks to sweep beneath his wings, and then he is headed to Jerusalem where he will, in essence, fly off from his chicks alone and draw God's judgment to him so that the jaws of death might sink their teeth into his flesh only and not into his children whom he loves with a mother hen's protective passion. Do you see the image? So what kind of chance does this hen have going against the likes of a fox such as Herod? Some friendly Pharisees warned Jesus this morning that Herod wants to kill him. No surprise there. Herod has already chopped off the head of John the Baptist at a wild party where anything went. And a chicken's head wouldn't mean much. Put it on the chopping block. Be done with all this squawking about peace and poor people. How annoying, Jesus probably bugged the living daylights out of Herod. But this is the world we live in. Foxes have always had a certain influence and attraction over God's children in this or any century. And they may not be quite as bizarre and murderous as Herod. But foxes still slyly woo away the heart's of God's brood. And this is the thing. Jesus is powerless to stop it. He can walk on water and raise the dead, but he cannot make us love him. He desires such love, but he cannot force it cannot keep us from slamming the screen door in his face, defenseless against the many Herods waiting in the shadows. And one of the hardest things in life is loving someone you know and you can't shelter or protect. So what's Jesus' plan? What's he going to do now? Strangely, his plan is to keep offering the love of a mother hen. Keep spreading his wings. He will offer his life to Herod on our behalf. He will follow us into the darkness we have chosen for ourselves over and over and over again. He will place himself between that darkness and us. And if you look closely at this man hanging on the cross, his arms eternally outstretched, the span of his reach on that wood will begin to resemble the loving wings of a mother hen, gathering up her chicks in a love that doesn't make sense but breaks our hearts if we look long enough. 
Jesus does not count on the world ever seeing or understanding such love. And even as he hangs there with wings nailed to a tree, he cannot make us love him, cannot make us accept his love, but his desire for us is there, always eternally there. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Now he said that over 2,000 years ago, and he says that today. Jesus was a powerful teacher, a worker of miracles, a prophet who shook this world to its foundations. But you know what? I've decided that he is not all powerful. It may sound shocking and even unorthodox, but he's not. There's one little thing that Jesus needs of you. One thing he desires but cannot or will not control. He desires your will. He desires your will. Your proud, defiant control over your destiny. And to relinquish that is both the hardest and the sweetest thing we will ever do. And every day, every day, we start again.